Good evening everyone, time for another member update. This is a silver chart that I posted to the free blog. This is the monthly chart provided by netdania.com. Now, this is the long view going all the way back to about 1995 or so. So we're approaching a 20 year chart here. The lines I've drawn here are arrows pointing to how the MACD did relative to the zero line and you can see that we're in unprecedented territory at negative two. So it's my opinion that we're building the biggest base in the history of the world for silver a base larger than anything we've seen before. If you look back at the 2008 correction that we had, we had that downdraft period that really only lasted from not even a year really from about uh, the top was in March and then we got uh, a bottom around in October. Now this one that we have here we have the May 1st top in uh, 2011 we come all the way down to a bottom potentially the bottom of 2013 so a much bigger formation uh, of course when we we're in this formation the way the perspective works is that uh, things look much smaller in the past for example, in 2004, when we were in this correction, it looked like a gigantic formation. But uh, in retrospect, it just looks like a tiny blip on the radar, radar screen. And that's how markets work. So this one is forming to be twice as big as 2008. Will we get twice as big of a launch uh, than we had in 2008? We got a run from about $8 to $50. That would give us a run. Uh, over a hundred dollars maybe hundred twenty five dollars so uh, if that's the case and the pattern follows then there's still a couple years for this to form and and uh, average itself out between 35 and 45 bucks before it makes the run on new highs again that will be the biggest formation we've ever seen in this now I did post a new poll on the member site here and that is whether or not you believe this is the this is the last silver bottom, the one we hit at about 18.5, uh, is that the final final dollar bottom? And uh, I'm talking about the price of silver in dollars. I'm not going to talk about other currencies, but is this going to be the final dollar bottom? And uh, of course, I voted yes. You can see that uh, there were nine votes yes, six votes no, and uh, so far four votes that are not sure. So uh, the yeses are leading that uh, people who believe this is the final bottom for silver. Now I wanted to take you to a couple of stories for the night. Really big stories. This is a story that only we covered here. Uh, my wife found this story. This is the swift issue and we're going to spend most of the time on that. But before we do that I wanted to look at this Bix Weir release that came out today about Jeffrey Christian and uh, the headline is silver expert Jeffrey Christian proves illegal comics price setting now the chart that Bix used here is the uh, May 1st Smackdown this is a very important date I've referred to many times uh, it was a uh, triple witching for the news it was a nighttime attack it uh, was near the time Barack Obama released publicly his birth certificate supposedly and it was the capture of Osama bin Laden so this was a big big event here and you can see that the price of silver dropped from $48 to $42 it probably went lower here because of the uh, granularity of this chart but an enormous move in the overnight and uh, Bix points out here that uh, the volume and the number is ridiculous so he says in a stunning admission last week at the silver summit in Spokane Washington CPM groups president Jeffrey Christian a longtime opponent of silver market rigging claims admitted that the price of silver was being 
illegally set on the COMEX trading floor. This admission came during his attempt to prove that there was no silver market manipulation taking place. Christian's assertion was that the wild swings in the silver price were not being caused by rogue market riggers, but by multiple computer algorithms and high frequency trading programs firing at the same time on the COMEX silver exchange based on the same program triggers. Christian claims that the simultaneous nature of these trades spring from all trading houses using the same algorithms they learned at the same colleges. Trading volumes on the COMEX supports this assertion as the COMEX is on track to trade over 80 billion equivalent ounces of silver derivatives in 2013, which is 1,800 times the amount of registered physical silver on the COMEX, which is 44 million ounces. So Bix goes on to explain that uh, the fact that that occurs and the fact that Jeffrey Christian admits that it is the HFT and algorithms that are driving the price of silver is an admission that the CFTC has failed its duty because, of course, we know the purpose of the CFTC uh, one of the main purposes, if not the most important purpose, is to make sure that derivatives and paper trading and speculators are not setting the price of these key commodities, but the price of key commodities is actually being set by supply and demand. So that's a very important article. Now I wanted to look at this SWIFT article, and uh, before we get to the news of it, we're going to look at the definition and explanation of what SWIFT is. So SWIFT is, this is from the Wikipedia, SWIFT is the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. The Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, SWIFT, provides a network that enables financial institutions worldwide to send and receive information about financial transactions in a secure, standardized, and reliable environment. SWIFT also sells software and services to financial institutions, much of it for use on the SWIFT network. Sorry, I got lost. The chairman of SWIFT is Yawar Shah, who is from Pakistan. The CEO is Gottfried Liebrandt, who is from the Netherlands. So that's very interesting that uh, we've got Pakistan, which is right at the very center of this kind of weakening of the petrodollar. And then we've got, of course, the Netherlands. And we're going to see that's uh, key in all of this. The majority of international interbank messages use the SWIFT network As of September 2010, SWIFT linked more than 9,000 financial institutions in 209 countries and territories who were exchanging an average of over 15 million messages per day compared to an average of 2.4 million daily messages in 1995. SWIFT transports financial messages in a highly secure way but does not hold accounts for its members and does not perform any clearing or settlements. SWIFT does not facilitate fund transfers, rather it sends payment orders which must be settled by correspondent accounts that the institutions have with each other. Each financial institution to exchange banking transactions must have a banking relationship by either being a bank or affiliating itself with one or more so as to enjoy those particular business features. SWIFT hosts annual conferences, etc. SWIFT was founded in Brussels, Brussels, Belgium, under the leadership of its inaugural CEO, Carl Reuterskold, and was supported by 239 banks. SWIFT has become the industry standard for syntax in financial messages. The SWIFT Secure Messaging Network is run from two redundant data centers, one in the United States and one in the Netherlands. These centers share information in near real time. In case of failure in one of the data centers, the other is able to handle the traffic of the complete network. SWIFT opened a third data center in Switzerland, which started operating in 2009. Since then, data from European SWIFT members will no longer be mirrored to the U.S. data center. 
the distributed architecture will partition messaging into two messaging zones, European and transatlantic. The European zone messages are stored in the Netherlands and in part of the Switzerland operating center. Transatlantic zone messages are stored in the United States and in a part of the Switzerland operating center that is segregated from the European zone messages. Very important. You can see that it's actually now moving to Europe where the main site is because the United States is no longer the main site. It's becoming the European site. Countries outside of Europe were by default allocated to the transatlantic zone but could choose to have their messages stored in the European zone. Very interesting stuff here. All in between the lines. You have to read in between the lines but you can see a power struggle between the United States and the EU. And this goes into the architecture. It was run on X25. It's now on IP. And then there's SwiftNet Phase 2 and the products. And then there's the news about Swift. Terrorist Finance Tracking Program. A series of articles published on the 23rd of June 2006 by the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Los Angeles Times revealed that the U.S. Treasury Department and the U.S. Central Intelligence Agencies and other government agencies had a program to access the Swift Transaction Database after the September 11th attacks called Terrorist Finance Tracking Program. After these articles, SWIFT quickly came under pressure for compromising the data privacy of its customers by letting foreign government, the United States government, agencies access sensitive personal data. In September 2006, the Belgian government declared that the SWIFT dealings with the U.S. government authorities were a breach of Belgian and European privacy laws. In response, SWIFT is in the process of improving its architecture to satisfy member privacy concerns by implementing the new distributed architecture with a two-zone model for storing messages. Concurrent to this process, the European Union negotiated an agreement with the United States government to, to permit the transfer of intra-EU SWIFT transaction information to the United States under certain circumstances. Due to concerns about potential contents, the European Parliament adopted a position statement in September 2009 demanding to see the full text of the agreement and requesting that it be fully compliant with EU privacy legislation with appropriate oversight mechanisms in place to ensure that all data requests were handled appropriately. And there's more about the European concern for civil liberties. Now, of course, the Iran sanctions is a very important story here because they were kicked out of the SWIFT system. In January 2012, the advocacy group United Against Nuclear Iran implemented a campaign calling on SWIFT to end all relations with Iran's banking system, including the Central Bank of Iran. UANI asserted that Iran's membership in SWIFT violated U.S. and EU financial sanctions against Iran as well as SWIFT's own corporate rules. Consequently, in February 2012, the U.S. Senate Banking Committee unanimously approved sanctions against SWIFT aimed at pressuring the Belgian financial telecommunications network. Right there they tell you it's Belgian to terminate its ties with blacklisted Iranian banks. Expelling Iranian banks from SWIFT would potentially deny access to billions of dollars in revenue and spending using SWIFT, but not from using IVTS. Mark Wallace, president of UNA and I, praised the Senate Banking Committee. Initially, SWIFT denied it was acting illegally, but now says it is working with U.S. and European governments to address their concerns that its financial services are being used by Iran to avoid sanctions and conduct illicit business. Targeted banks would be, amongst others, Sadarat Bank of Iran, Bank Malat, Post Bank of Iran, Sava Bank. On 17th of March 2012, following agreement two days later, earlier between all 27 member states of the Council of the European Union and Council's subsequent ruling, SWIFT disconnected all Iranian banks from its international network that had been identified as institutions in breach of current EU sanctions and warned that 
even more Iranian financial institutions could be disconnected from the network. U.S. control over transactions within the European Union. On the 26th of February 2012, the Danish newspaper Berlinski reported that U.S. authorities evidently have sufficient control over SWIFT to seize money being transferred between two EU countries, Denmark and Germany, since they have seized around $26,000, which were being transferred from a Danish businessman to a German bank. The money was a payment for a batch of Cuban cigars previously imported to Germany by a German supplier. As justification for the seizure, the U.S. Treasury has stated that the Danish businessmen had violated the United States embargo against Cuba. Now that is hilarious, that the United States would enforce an embargo that its own citizens could not purchase goods made in Cuba, and they would enforce that against a Danish businessman who was doing a transaction with a German bank. Monitoring of the SWIFT transactions by the NSA. Der Spiegel reported in September 2013 that the NSA widely monitors banking transactions via SWIFT as well as credit card transactions. The NSA intercepted and retained data from SWIFT network used by thousands of banks to securely send transaction information. SWIFT was named as a target according to documents leaked by Edward Snowden. The documents reveal that the NSA spied on SWIFT using a variety of methods including reading SWIFT printer traffic from numerous banks. So that is the story from Wikipedia. Now let's look at the news here about what is happening regarding SWIFT. You can see this is a story from the 23rd of this month. The European Parliament votes to suspend its SWIFT data exchange agreement with the US. The European Parliament has voted to suspend its SWIFT data exchange agreement with the US. They've called for US access to the SWIFT database to be halted following concerns that the U.S. is spying on the EU and not simply trying to combat terrorism. EU lawmakers suspect that the U.S. has abused an agreement giving it limited access to SWIFT. As such, they voted to freeze Washington's capacity to track international payments through the site. The worry comes after leaked American documents indicating that the U.S. Is, was covertly tapping into SWIFT were aired on Brazilian television. The U.S. denies any wrongdoing. Although the vote is not conclusive, it does reflect public anger at recent reports that U.S. security agency, the NSA, is spying on European citizens. The European Commission said it was still waiting for additional written assurances that the U.S. is respecting its agreement with the EU. Sorry, I'm running out of time here. So let's wrap it up. Now, here's the U.S. backing down. U.S. officials considering an end to spying on allies. The White House is reportedly weighing ending a national security agency program that allowed the organization to spy on foreign leaders. Faced with a flood of revelations about U.S. spying practices, the White House is considering ending eavesdropping on foreign leaders, a senior administration official said. The final decision has not been made. The official said the administration is trying to tamp down damage from the months-long spying scandal. Now, there's some quotes from Diane Feinstein. Of course, we know this Angela Merkel uh, controversy with her cell phone. The official was not authorized to discuss the review by name and insisted on anonymity. Lawmakers were set to press for more information about surveillance programs at a House Intelligence Committee hearing Tuesday afternoon. Reports based on new leaks from former NSA systems analyst Edward Snowden indicate that the NSA had listened to Merkel and 34 other foreign leaders. So this is really heating up here. Uh, what does this all mean? What it means is that the SWIFT system, which has been the key system that the United States has used to squeeze Iran out of the interbank system, uh, we've seen from Wikipedia that that is actually kind of a dual system uh, where the EU has a certain amount of power and the US has a certain amount of power. Now the United States is being challenged by the European Union uh, 
based on privacy violations and other things. This is very, very important news. And the reason why is because the SWIFT system so far has been dominated by the United States. It has the ability to say who is in and who is out. And uh, if you're kicked out of the SWIFT system, it's pretty much a financial death sentence because your bank is unable to do any transactions with other banks. So we're beginning to see cracks in this US hegemony over SWIFT. And as I said here in this article, collapse of SWIFT would mean a SWIFT collapse of the petrodollar. What this means is the end of the ability of the United States to unilaterally declare a nation, a terrorist nation. Uh, that decision would uh, begin to be decentralized and uh, the U.S. is rapidly losing power and the ability to prop up its petrodollar system. We said for the longest time that the petrodollar and of course the enforcement arm of that is going to be swift and uh, the armies that are used etc but uh, that system is rapidly crumbling the united states is losing its ability to control the rest of the world and now we're seeing the eu begin to buckle and uh, turn away from u.s hegemony and begin to require uh, privacy of their SWIFT transactions. Of course, if you have a system like that that's not totally dominated by one party, then the decentralization will uh, cause the breakdown of the petrodollar, U.S. hegemony overall, and complete control of the financial system. And this will begin the inevitable collapse of the U.S. empire. And we'll talk to you next time.